Well, I know it's been several weeks since uh, Jerry had asked me to do scripture, and, and so y'all got nine pages tonight. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm not getting. laughs> no, but I told Sister Tracy sometimes, you know, when things like that happen and it's delayed, you know, everything I ever want to get up and say or do, I want it to go through me first. I believe that's how the Lord wants it to, to be, because I think it's more effective when we preach or teach or testify of our own experience than it is out of somebody else's. It's good to share with somebody else's, but when it's yours, it just seems like the Lord just gets more glory out of that. But I, I don't really have a specific place unless you just want to turn to Isaiah 55 and 6 is where I'm going to start out. I really struggled with trying to find a name for this. And I went in all different types of directions. And I, to be honest with you, I don't know what's going to happen tonight. And if the Lord don't come by, well, we're we, we just going to be in trouble. Y'all just going to hear a bunch of notes. But if he comes by tonight and helps us, then we'll do what God right, has right. us to do. Yeah. Isaiah 55 and 6 simply says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him. While he is near. Thank you, Lord. And I, I just simply have this title, Seeking the Face of God. Psalms 27 and 8 says, When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my, my heart said, Thy face I will seek. Amen. Psalms 105 and 4 says, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore or continually. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, Seek those things which are above. Seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above and not on the things of the earth. We all know, or at least I hope we do by now, for all seasoned Christians here tonight, that praying and seeking is two different things. We can pray, but there's something more that goes with seeking. The Lord spoke these scriptures to me one Sunday morning back here when I was just praying and seeking God for the uh, service that morning. I always try to go back there, Lord willing, and pray a little season of prayer there before we come out. I got in the habit of doing that when uh, we were out in the sanctuary and I had to teach every Sunday, so I would go back there and pray and seek the Lord before I come out to teach. So since we've come out here, I've just kind of tried to keep that going there because I believe it's important to seek God for the services. And as I was seeking him, the Lord spoke this scripture into my mind, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So I believe that what I'm going to give to you tonight is an urgent request and a wooing by God and the Holy Ghost to us who is the church once again to seek the face Amen. of God. Now, to move beyond the rituals of 15 minutes of Bible reading, if you're like me, you're going through the one-year Bible app and you're taking every day and reading those scriptures or letting those scriptures read to you, and it's more than just a 15 minutes of Bible reading and a little prayer throughout the week here or there. And going from survival mode to a personal revival mode. Seeking the face of God in the Hebrew meant seeking his presence. Why did the scripture say, seek ye my face? What does the face have to do with it? So I wrote down a few things here. It says, the face of a person can reveal much more about a person than an example texting. Now, well, I'm not a big text person. I, I use it because I have to, but I don't really like texting. Number one reason why I don't like texting is because by the time I done figured out what I'm going to say back, they done asked me, you know, said something else, and then I'm trying to reply to the second thing. <laughs> but the second reason why I don't like texting is you can't tell, you can't see a person's face. And you can't tell what their tone is when they text it. They might be texting back, okay. Or they might be texting back saying, okay. 
<laughs> you really don't know in a text, you know, especially with women. I don't know if men have this problem or not. What the tone is in the texting. You can't hear it, what they're saying, and you can't see their face when they're texting it. So you really don't know. The same thing goes for a telephone conversation. You might hear what they're saying, but you can't see their facial expressions and what they're talking to you. They might be talking to you like this, but <laughs> deep down, they're really not really wanting to talk to you. <laughs> so face, seeking the face of God reveals Amen. expressions. Yeah. A face, my face, your face, reveal expressions. It can reveal inward emotions, and the face is the representative of our whole body. You can look at somebody in the face, and you can pretty much tell if you know them well enough uh, what's going on with them. Right. If they're happy, sad, hurting, right. you know, discouraged, or, or or whatever the case is. When you look at a person's face, you also look at somebody's face to recognize them. If you want to find out if that's the person, you, you know, from the back, you may not can tell. But if they turn around and you see their face, then you can say, oh, that's brother, sister, so and so. Right, amen. And so the face is seeking the face of God is more than just a mere uh, little bit of prayer time here and there. It, it takes a little bit more to seek out God. And so to look someone in the face means we have to come close to them. Right. And if we want to seek God's face, we've got to come close to right. Him. We've got to, how do I do that? Through prayer and through seeking the face of God. You see, God wants us to come, being face to face with God is like real intimacy. I don't just get up in anybody's face because that's personal. That's a personal right. space. There. Right. You know, some people don't have a problem. And some people like to intimidate you by looking you dead in the eye when they're talking to you as an intimidation tag tactic. And that don't work very well with me. I just look right back. But, you know, that's supposed to be a time of when you can look somebody face to face, eye to eye. It, it says that you know that person well enough to do that. It requires an intimacy to look intently into someone else's eyes. It can also be a pursuing, a wooing, and an earnestly seeking after God. So being face to face to God is like seeking the face of God. Amen. The face can reveal more about a person than any other part of Thank the body. Thank you, Lord. So in seeking the face of God, we're really seeking the expressed image of God, which is Jesus, his son. Right. Second Chronicles 7, 14, we can quote it this, if my people, my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek the face of God. You know, he put that there for a reason, that so that we would humble ourselves down under the mighty hand of God and seek the face of God. Right. And sometimes pride can be in opposition to that humbling ourselves down. But humility and submission go hand in hand. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6 tells us to be clothed in humility. You know, I was telling Sister Tracy, I, I had that word come to my mind the other day about the word, just the word merge. You know, in traffic, you know, when you're coming onto the interstate, or, or as an example, uh, you have to merge into traffic. What do you do when you merge? You allow somebody to come in front of you. You saying, I give you the right of way. Right. So what we're doing in seeking the face of God is we're saying, Lord, I yield to you. I right. merge and let you come Thank in front you, of Lord. me and let you lead me. Amen. Let you have free course. And I can't do, he can't do that without my Hallelujah. permission. As awesome and wonderful and great as God is, he's not going to go over our will. No. We have to be willing to merge and let God have his way. To let our adornment be that of a meek and quiet spirit to be to obey the Lord with reverence and do exactly what God wants us to do in every situation. That takes a little bit more than just a prayer here and there. Come on. That takes seeking because I don't know what to do in every situation. But if I'm seeking him, he will show me what to do. 2 Corinthians 3 and 5 says we're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And who is the greatest example of humility? Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is the greatest example we have of humility. 
So ask God, and if you're having problems seeking or seeing the face of God, to remove anything that might be blocking or obscuring your view. Come on. It's just that simple. Yeah. We make it hard. Obstacles dull, can dull the face of God. Come on. Yeah. And that can be a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. Obstacles can be a whole lot yeah. of stuff. But it can dull our view of the face of God. Revelations 3.18 says, And anoint mine eyes with eye salve. In other words, Lord, apply that healing ointment that the eyes of thine understanding would be enlightened. Yeah. Ephesians 5 and 19. Spiritual vision is crucial yeah. and critical to the child of God. Here, spiritual vision of Eli had grown dim. His, the Bible says his eyes had grown dim or weak, and Eli had allowed the oil of the light of the lamp to go out in the temple because he couldn't see that it was getting low. Because his eyes had grown dim. He lost his conviction of sin. His eyes did not let him see the condition or the, or the wickedness of sin being allowed in the temple that God had placed him right. on. All because of that. Sardis and Laodicea were the only two churches that was specified that no opponents from without but them things that were within. In other words, since I'm talking to seasoned Christians tonight, I'm not talking about things that is happening out there in that world that's causing your eyes to go dim. I'm talking about things that's in here right. that can obstruct the what we see spiritually. So he said here, if thine eye be single, means single-eyed, means if thine eye be healthy, if thine eye be healthy, then you can see and your focus, your eyes, your focus then is on the Lord. And the light of the body, the Bible says, is the eye. Yeah. But if thine eye be evil, he said, and that word evil there means unhealthy eye, means it's not seeing clearly. You ever been there where you just didn't quite see clearly? Maybe something, you know, in that heart got in there that shouldn't have been and and festered and grew and now it's getting a little hard to see what God's trying to say and, and to spend time alone with him I can't see your face Lord Come because on. something in there in this heart is obstructing that view so we cry out oh Lord anoint our eyes with eyesalve that we may see thy face pull back the curtain that blinds us that you may reveal yourself unto us Yeah. now <laughs> I don't understand why people, Christians, don't pray that Christ would reveal himself to them like they used to. It's almost like you don't hear that anymore. But seeking his face and the brightness of his countenance, Matthew 5 and 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart. Come on. If you're pure in heart, guess what? You ain't going to have no problem seeing God. That's right. <laughs> I want to ask you tonight, how badly do you want to see the face of God? Right. How badly do you really want to see the face of God? Now, I know we sing in the Red Back Hymnal, Oh, I want to see him. We sung it, I think, the last service. But do you really? Come on. Do you really want to see? Come on. Seeking means that you have a desire to know him, his character, and wanting him and his presence and his favor more than anything else that any person or thing could give us. Now, I'm going to give you an example of seeking because I had this happen one time to me when uh, Emily was about three years old. And this is when I made that statement more than anything else. Just just say you've lost your child somewhere. And I lost Emily one time. We lived up on the hill and... and she was about three years old, and I used to worry about them when they'd go outside because we had that little pond down there. And I was always afraid they was going to get down there playing and fall in. And I couldn't find her nowhere. And I looked and looked and looked. And I done got to the point where I was in panic mode, and I finally called Leon and told Leon, I said, I can't find Emily nowhere. I've, I've tore this house up. I've looked outside. I've went, you know, looked at the pond everywhere. So he comes home, brings home some of the 
uh, men he was working with, and and we all go to looking, and we and we finally found her, and she was down there back on the back side of our of our land at an old I think it was either chickens or rabbits or something we had back there that was in there that I didn't even know she even remembered at three years old was there. We didn't have them no more, and she was down there, and she had crawled up inside that that pen and was sitting in there. <laughs> But I can tell you that I was seeking for my child. Yeah. Now, at that moment, I was focused. It didn't matter to me if my phone rung because on. I'm seeking. It didn't matter to me what was going on on Facebook, even right. though we didn't have one back then. But if we would had a Facebook, I could have cared less what was on there because I was seeking yeah. my child. It was a matter to me of life and death. And the day we quit making prayer and seeking God a matter of life and death is why we're come in the on, shape we're in. Come on. It didn't matter to me uh, 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 any situation of what was going on. Any, nothing could take my attention away from come the on. fact that I had to find my child. Yeah. And when we get so desperate for God that that's how we seek Him, we will find Him. Yeah. He said, when you search for me come on. with all of your heart. Oh, yeah. Psalms 27 and 4 says this one thing he was focused on this one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold or to see the beauty of the Lord and to inquire or to seek him in his temple Yeah. now where are we okay David here wasn't talking about loading up and taking all his furniture and everything and moving into the temple and just sitting in there every day, seven days a week. He wasn't talking about moving into the church house of the Lord because in Psalms 119, 164, David was pursuing and praying to the Lord seven times a day. Yeah. In the Old Testament, seven times a day. He'd stop and pray or praise or worship or do something. So he wasn't literally, figuratively meaning, I want to go pack up and live in the temple all the time. He was already praying. But he desired something more than just prayer. Yeah. But to seek the face of God, to go deeper, to grow in the grace of God. Psalms 105 and 4 says, Seek his face or his presence evermore continually, his manifest consciousness and trusted presence. Yeah. Just, just break it on down. For God is not limited to a temple or a church. We don't have to wait. John 4, 21 says, There will come an hour, time and an hour when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem you will worship the Father. So we don't have to just do it on the mountain in Jerusalem. We don't have to do it in a temple. We don't have to just do it at the house of God. We can see the face of God all and anywhere. Now, in the Old Testament, they made it all about the temple because that's all they had. They had that temple that they would go to but that turned into a ritual and a routine. And a lot of people has been speculating, why has all these things happened to the church? What's going on? What's, how is God moving in this? And I, I've been one of them. But just like the Old Testament church turned their going to the temple into a ritual and a routine, Jesus came into the temple and he drives out all that bought, sold, and threw out the money changers. And what did he say? My house should be called a house of prayer. Think about that for a moment. They had been seeking and praying in a form or a ritual. And, and if you don't have time, that's what they said, you know, uh, uh, in that Old Testament temple, they said, oh, if you don't have time, you know, to go by and get them doves. And if you don't have time to go change out your money, and if you don't have time to go pick out that animal that don't have no spot or blemish on, on it, because it had to be a certain kind yeah, of animal. Yeah. And there was different animals and different things for different types of sacrifices. And they said, you just come on to the house of God. We got all the doves and we got all the animals for come your on. sacrifice. Look, we've made it user friendly. Come oh, on to the my. house of God. No more sacrificing any extra time trying to prepare to come to the house of God. Don't worry about praying and seeking 
can, till you get here. We've done sought out the best animal and we've got it all right here ready for you. And Jesus said, get out. Come on. Of my house. Yeah. You bunch of den of thieves. Yeah. That's what he said. And he whipped them out of there and said, my house is going to be called a house of prayer. We today don't know anymore what seeking the face of God is. You want me to tell you what the old timers called it and what they taught me? They said it was called praying through. Yeah. Praying through. Yeah. Don't just go down and pray, but pray through. To you, what does that mean? Pray through to you touch the hem of his garment. Pray through to the Holy Ghost comes and, and speaks through you in that heavenly heavenly language. Pray through to you know that you now I know every time it's not gonna be like uh, uh lightning bolts like the uh, brother said here tonight. It's not always gonna be that, but you gonna know if you pray through. Yeah. And so I can't help but think that we made church just like they did in that Old Testament, just a Sunday thing or a Sabbath thing. Come on. Where the preachers paid to pray for us, yet we still want the same move of God our forefathers oh, had. Oh, my. Send it on down, Lord. <laughs> I can't help but think in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 through 27, it talks about the shaking. He said... Yet once more I will shake not only earth, but heaven also. Yet this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things which are shaken, as of the things which that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Yeah. Now here's something I found out. Mm -hmm. Hebrews was written between 67 and 69 A.D. Now, they didn't say they don't know who wrote Hebrews. Some people say Paul, so it don't matter to me. But I can tell you that the writer of Hebrews, when he wrote this scripture here, when he wrote the book of Hebrews, it was just a year or so before the falling of the Old Testament temple. Centuries, folks, centuries of years of sacrificing and coming to the temple year after year or a place of ritual, a place of routine, that all of a once, all at once, Jesus uh, there and, and 70 years after Jesus ascended, that temple is gone. What happened to it? It was destroyed by the Romans. The temple was destroyed only a year or so after this shaking took place. And he said, and yet once more will I also shake it again. So if he shook it then, sometimes I wonder if that ain't what's going on now. That judgment hasn't begun at the house of God. And the New Testament church then, because of that shaking, was scattered abroad. We today don't know what's to become of what we call church as we know it. Come on. It's changed. Yeah. A shaking's took place. Yeah. But we do know that the church is the body of Christ. Yeah. And that it's not within four walls of a building, but in you and I. Oh, Yet I'm you. afraid we've done the same thing that the Old Testament done and limited the Holy One of Israel to just a Sunday. Come on. Just a Sunday. I saw you get, Lord. It's just a Sunday. God help us. And, and to a place where only at church do we pray. And only at church do we might seek him and only at church do we worship and only at church can people get saved what happened to people coming in off the road led by the holy come ghost here to come into the house yeah. of god to get saved what happened to that because people are not seeking him people are not come praying and, I, and i'm telling you this went through me first we must seek the face of god seek him now while he may be found call upon him while he's while he's near, you know, uh, um, here in Song of Solomon. And I'm almost through, y'all. Oh, Chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. I may read that one. Yeah, let's read that one. <laughs> Jerry preached on this not long ago and did a wonderful job. But this is Song of Solomon. This fifth chapter here is one of my favorite chapters in the whole entire Bible. And it says here in verse 1, I am coming to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. 
I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink ye, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. Now this is what the Lord's telling us to do. He's, he wants us to come in and seek him. He's got abundant everything that we need. Come on. He's, verse 2 says, I slept, but my heart waked. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put in his hand in the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh, upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Now here we see that the Lord here has come to, the, to his bride. And, and we're that bride that he's come to today. And he's asking us to seek him while he may be found. So open to me, my beloved, my dove. The Holy Ghost is saying to us. But we, good seasoned Christians of the Lord, has been serving him you know, for some time, says, I'm clean. I'm clean, Lord. I, I, I've been praying some, and I do read my Bible. Come on now. I, I'm, I'm one of them ten virgins, Lord. And, and I don't do anything wrong. I'm not out here in this world. I'm not committing oh, sin or fornication or adultery or drinking or whatever. Lord, don't you know that I'm I'm tired? I'm, I'm tired. and But I'm a good person and I'm a Christian and I'm clean. But I just don't have time to get up and pray and seek the face of God and to worship you. Mm. You know... I guess that's one of the hardest things because she said, Lord, how can I get up and dirty my feet again? In other words, she felt clean enough. She felt just enough Come of on. a Christian and just clean enough that she didn't feel like she had to get up and pray. And that's when, I, you know, Sister Jean was talking about that yesterday at prayer meeting about how sometimes we, we get at ease in Zion or we get comfortable and we've been serving the Lord so long, and, and we just, you know, we ain't really doing anything wrong. We're still coming to church, still praying, you know, paying our tithes or whatever. And so we feel like, you know, hey, Lord, why are you waking me up in the middle of the night? Come on. I'm a good Christian. It's kind of like the telephone conversation I heard uh, someone say the other day. He said a man, the uh, Lord laid somebody on his heart, and he'd been looking for an opportunity to call him. And said he finally called him on the phone. And, and you know how you do when you call somebody on the phone. You go through a few formalities. Hey, how you doing? What, how's your day? Blah, blah, blah. And the person just starts talking, talking, talking. Telling all about their their day or whatever's been going on in their life. It depends on how long you've talked to them. And then all of a sudden, before you can even say why you even called them to talk to them, they said, well, I appreciate you calling, Sister Judy. <laughs> talk to you later. Bye. And they hang up. And you're like, well. I didn't get a word in edgeways. I was going to tell them something the Lord told me, you know, or what have you. We've all done it. We've probably been on both sides of that conversation. And, and, and that's what we do with the Lord. You know, praying and seeking is like, seeking is like uh, uh, we pray and, and we pray and we tell the Lord, you know, all the basic things, you know, you know, this, that, and other, and we pray the basic things. And But seeking goes a little further. On, but a lot of times all we do is we get done and just pray. And before we've had a chance for God to even say anything back, we say, well, okay, Lord, thank you, God. Amen, God. And uh -huh. we hang up before God has time yeah. to talk back. And what we really need to do is connect back with what God has to say. Yeah, You know, we're saying over here, amen, and God's saying, hello, amen, and we really saw it. And this one last thing I wanted to bring out about seeking was, and I read this and looked it up, made sure it was true, it was about a Kansas City drought. They had 40 days of no rain. They called for a community prayer meeting because they needed rain. 40 days of no rain has terrible consequences. And this was out in Kansas. And so one woman came. Well, let me, let me skip over that right there. Let me just skip on over. 
This, let me read to you what a Kansas City drought of 1996 said. Some was like the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. <coughs> That's what I feel like sometimes when I'm trying to pray. Lord, it's dry. <coughs> There's got so much dust down here, Lord. I'm trying to dig out this well and get to some water, but it's dry, Lord. And dust clouds, they said there was dust clouds that roared through the whole town. This is 1996. They said that the, the dust clouds were so bad that it had blinding traffic. Blinding means they couldn't see. It means that the cattle was choking and everything, the wind and the dust bowl was blowing away all the topsoil and what was called the wheat capital of the world had a drought. I believe we must be living in a drought because we're, or something's going on because we're not getting no water here. Come on. And so with scorched fields and dry skies, with more than $3 billion lost, they said in total, well, somebody figured all that up, and lost crops, it not only affected the, the crops, but it affected the, the livestock, and it had a ripple effect all the way in from Kansas into Nebraska, Colorado, Oklahoma, and even into to Texas because you see our lack of prayer and seeking the face of God has brought about a drought. Yeah. And and that has had a far reaching consequences. See, it don't just uh, affect us, you know, when we're not praying and seeking God. It starts with us. But that ain't where it ends. Come on now. You know, it goes on to our families. Oh, and then all of a sudden, you're not praying and seeking God who is. Right. And then your families are affected by your prayerlessness and your and and then your your job begins to suffer because of it. Because I'm gonna tell you, if you're a child of God and you work on a job, that that company's blessed because you're there. But if you're not praying and you're not seeking God, then it starts affecting the job. And then before long, it's affecting the church. And the and we're wondering why, what's going on with the pastor when we really need to be wondering what's going on with us. Are we praying and seeking? And then it trickles out of the church and goes into our communities, this drought of non-prayer life. And then into our world, and this is what we have today. What's going on? Everything's going on out there because somebody quit praying. That's all you can say. Somebody quit praying and seeking the face of God. Now, what goes on out in that world can be totally different than what goes on in the house of God. See, the Lord can still be moving and, and touching and changing lives in here no matter what goes on out there. But instead, it's had a reverse effect. What's going on out there is affecting what's going Come on. on. And I'm concerned that we got to do something. One man stood up at this prayer meeting that they had about this drought because they called this community prayer meeting. And he said, this was his words, Mr. Grant Boyce, it's a good yet painful reminder that even with all our agricultural technology on our side, man cannot live without God's help. Right. We must humble ourselves and pray yeah. and seek the face of God. Now, when they called that community prayer meeting, they had spread the word all throughout and everybody showed up to come to the prayer meeting. And, you know, they was in their flip-flops and no short, I mean, no no shoes and some had shorts on and and everything because it'd been dry for 40 days and hot in the 90s some almost up to the hundreds in some days and I can't get this thing on <laughs> this, this one lady dear saint of God showed up to the prayer meeting with all her galoshes and raincoats <laughs> and umbrellas and and I wore these duck shoes tonight because they say they're good for water. And when she walked up, everybody was looking at her like, what in the world? Is she gone crazy? And sometimes I feel like at church. 
Sometimes, you know, you're praying and you sought God and you show up at church and you're trying to, you're over here trying to, whoa, hallelujah. People looking at you like, what is wrong? Come on. Come on. Why is she acting like that? We ain't been acting like that around here. Come on, Angel. Great. She shows up and all this stuff and somebody finally got the nerve to go over and ask her and said, it's hot. Why you got all that on? What you doing with all that? And she said, I thought we come to pray for rain. <laughs> Amen. She come, come on. praying for the rain. Hallelujah. And she didn't care who, what it looked Hallelujah. like. Hallelujah. No matter if it's 40 days, Lord. $6 billion worth of nothing. All she knew was she was going to pray. God was going to answer. She was believing and expecting it to rain. But we're too scared to step out in faith and say, Lord, I, you know, we're like this. Lord, I believe you, God, I believe you. Oh, have it. Oh, Jesus. And we run back over here. Come on. I don't want to get too far out there, Lord. I'm going to say, Come Lord, on. it gets cut off out of my So what? You believe in God? You trust in God? That don't mean every time you pray, though, the, the, the windows of heaven is going to open and pour down blessings upon you. But it does mean that you are praying with a believing and an expectation that God's going to answer you. If you seek him, he said you will be found in me. So we got to seek him. And we got to pray. And we got to pray and seek him like we expect him to answer our prayer. Let me give you some scripture and acts. Hallelujah. I don't know where I wrote that down yet. But in Acts, when they was praying for Peter. Come on. And they'd been praying. He was locked up in prison. And the Bible says that prayer was made without ceasing. <laughs> you know, they said that was old John Mark's mother that held a prayer meeting for, pre for Peter to get out of jail. And, and here they are over there praying and seeking God that Peter get out of jail. And you know what, what, what was so weird was that, that oh, oh, I need to find this. What I do with it? That when, when they got over there and she was, the, the prayer that they were praying was knocking at the door. Your answer's knocking at the door. And we, and we don't even realize it. And when, and when Rhoda went to the door and saw that it was Peter and she tried to tell him, they wouldn't even believe it. Because they didn't believe what they was praying. Come on. But what we're praying for, people, is right at the door. Wow. Jesus is right there. And, and all we got to do is just pray and ask. Him. And then when he answers, we got to believe it. Believe, expect what you pray for. Believe and expect what you pray for. Oh, I wish I could find my notes for that. I don't know what happened to them. Maybe I didn't need it. But anyway, you know, that's what we have to do. And, and, and sometimes when we pray and ask God for stuff, we don't, do we really believe he's going to answer it? Or are we just like, well, I don't, you know, I'm praying about that, but I don't know. I don't know. Pray expecting to receive and believe. Have an expectation when you can't come to house to the house of God that God's going to do what he said he's going to do. Keep knocking. The answer's at the door. Keep knocking. Keep believing. Keep praying. Keep seeking. Uh, prayer can be made without ceasing, but the church went into a season of intense intercession and prayer. And that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to just go in there and it ain't, I'm going to tell you from experience, it ain't always going to be, you know, uh, I've learned that I run out of words. I, I don't know how limited of a vocabulary I got till I get in prayer. And then I can't think of everything to say and I keep repeating myself and I feel like a parrot. And I'm like, Lord, this is a shame. I can't pray no longer in this because I... I run out of stuff to say. So you know what I started doing? I started, I go in there with my Bible and I'll, I'll open up and I start praying stuff out of the Bible, like especially out of Psalms. And I'll start reading that and then I'll pray that. And I say, well, that sounds good. I'm going to pray that. <laughs> and I'll start praying that. And before long, I'm done being in there praying and talking to the Lord. And then after I get through praying and seeking, then I try to sit there for just a little while to see what God has to say to me. Right. 
Because I've said a whole lot to him, but what does he have to say to me? And then he comes back and says, like he did in Song of Solomon, verse 6 and 13, Return, return, O Shulamite. And that's what God wants us to do. Return back to the prayer closets. Return back to seeking him. And that's the only way we're going to have a, a, a move of God. Amen. In our lives first, no, no, no. and then in the house of God. That's where it starts in our lives anyway. But I hope I made sense to y'all tonight. But when I when I thought when I read that story about that that thing online about that drought and I thought about that woman showing up like that, I thought about how ridiculous. You know, sometimes God asks us to do something ridiculous like stand up and worship him. Sometimes we have to stand up and kind of Get these old bones that's creaking and just start praising him and worshiping. We we don't want to, you know, we don't want to get too loud or nothing. But you know, just get yourself in the mind and the and the mode to worship, to raise your hands, to praise him, and and he might ask you to do something that might seem a little ridiculous, but do it because you don't know that that might be the key to the service. It might be. Or it might be just see if God's going to see if you obey him. So, but that's all I have tonight. I hope it blessed y'all as much as God um, helped me with it because it has really went through me in these past few months, especially a year in March, I think, has been uh, a greater time for my own personal seeking and praying and calling upon the Lord than I ever have in my whole entire Christian walk is what I've been trying to do this past time. It's really, I've asked God to wake me, to shake me, to do whatever, you know, he needed to do to get me out of my complacency and out of my own way of thinking. You know, praying and seeking God will give you the mind of Christ. Right. And so that's all I have tonight. I'm going to be rambling here. But God bless y'all.